Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So welcome to Crossroads Assembly of God. This is our Facebook live broadcast. I'm Pastor Joel. This is my wife, Linda. We're glad that you're here today. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I've been um, preaching all morning to the Mongolians. It's been uh, um, uh, quite a morning for me, um, and I'm excited about what God is doing. We're doing a seminar in Mongolia do, uh, using Facebook and uh, Monday and Tuesday, so we want you to be in prayer for that. Um, it, um, uh, we did the first time a recording, um, it, it'll be on, on our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to watch it, but, um, I, I just want to, want you to pray. It's an exciting yes. moment. And, uh, so we're going to begin today by reading from Psalm chapter number nine. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell it. All of the marvelous things you have done, I will be filled with joy because of you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. My enemies retreated, they staggered and died when you appeared. For you have judged in my favor. From your throne you have judged with fairness. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have erased their names forever. The enemy is finished in endless ruins. The cities you uprooted are now forgotten. But the Lord reigns forever, executing judgment from his throne. He will judge the world with justice and rule the nations with fairness. The Lord is a shelter for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, O Lord, do not abandon those who search for you. Sing praises to the Lord who reigns in Jerusalem. Tell the world about his unforgettable deeds, for he who avenges murder cares for the helpless. He does not ignore the cries of those who suffer. Lord, have mercy on me. See how my enemies torment me. Snatch me back from the jaws of death. Save me so I can praise you publicly at Jerusalem's gates, so I can rejoice that you have rescued me. The nations have fallen into the pit they dug for others. Their own feet have been caught in the trap they set. The Lord is known for his justice. The wicked are trapped by their own deeds. The wicked will go down to the grave. This is the fate of all nations who ignore God. But the needy will not be ignored forever. The hopes of the poor will not always be crushed. Arise, O Lord, do not let mere mortals defy you. Judge the nations. Make them tremble in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know they are merely human. Amen. Yes, you did a good job. I yeah. love it when the youth are reading scripture. Amen. But um, good morning. Uh, I just have a, a little thought from that I wanted to share with you from my favorite biblical character, which is David. And again, this is part of the Psalms, which is his meditation, his devotion, mm -hmm. his praise, his singing to the Lord. Um, I can imagine him because I'm kind of visual. I imagine him sitting on the hills with his sheep and his lyre or his harp or a stringed instrument, whatever he had, and lots of time to contemplate and, and think about the Lord, and he did that often. But this is in Psalms 84. The first two verses express in such a poetic way his longing for his God. And he says, How lovely, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty my soul yearn, yearns, even faints, for the courts of my God. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. That was such a expression of a soul that longs to know Jesus. Um, of course, he didn't know Jesus then, but the we know Jesus, the God Son. He is expressing his desire for that connection with God. And... Um, I love the way he does that because his soul is fainting. His heart and body are crying out for the presence of the Lord. This is why God revealed himself so much to David, because David had a hunger and a thirst for God, and that's the spiritual dynamic. And then in verse 3, he has an observation. 
He is saying, even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow has made a, a nest for herself where she will bear her young in a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. He's telling the Lord, even the swallows get to, um, you know, get to be close inside um, the tabernacle or the temple. He's, he's really longing for the temple. And um, and he's had observations or in his imagination where the swallows are building a nest even near the altar. And he says, even the swallows and the sparrows have access to you. And I long for that. Mm -hmm. And he's 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 making a plea for to God. David lived in a time when only priests approached the altar um, there was no tabernacle or no temple here. We all know that David desired to build a temple. He built the temple, but he could not. Well, Solomon built the temple, his son, but the desire was his. Um, and then in verse 4, he says, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. And I think that's a great observation even today. Those who come before the Lord, the very altar of God, figuratively and spiritually speaking, we are coming before the presence of the Lord. And we as New Testament believers have access mm -hmm. to, to God completely because of Christ and his sacrifice. He placed the blood upon the mercy seat of God, just like the priest did in the Old Testament, so that p people can make their plea and make their sacrifices and make their petitions before God. But Jesus has done that for us once and for all. And now we can come boldly before that altar. What a blessing that is. And David had a desire to do that. And he did do that even without a physical altar. His heart and his soul cried out and came near to the Lord. And that's why he is so featured in um, scriptures to, today because we have been given a place near the altar even where sparrows in the Old Testament used to build their nests and swallows. We've been given that place near the altar. And then he made this observation, which is, which is still relevant for today in verse 5. He says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, Lord, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. He's referring to the pilgrimage the Jewish people made every year for to to have their feasts, to celebrate their feasts in the temple. And he's, he's expressing that. And he says, as they, as they pass through the Valley of Baca, which is like bitterness, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Those who make their place near the altar they lay and, and confess their weakness before God. We are a weak people, but when we trust God, when we lean upon him and when we look to him and praise him and our heart is crying out for his strength, he so gives that to us. And we go from strength to strength. So even in our pilgrimage through this life, if we are passing through a valley which is hard and troublesome and bitter, even there, those who have, who have regularly gone to the altar, who have that place in Christ, they turn that valley into a spring of water, of refreshing. Because when they go to that altar, it will refresh them and it will strengthen them. And they will walk from strength to strength as we make our pilgrimage home, which is heaven our malt, our ultimate destination. So find an altar, find a place um, where you bow before the Lord and just pour out your heart to him and find a place where he can rule in your heart and life and you can lay your burdens down like the old song says because he will carry them for you and you will find a place of refreshing. Amen. 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 Thank you, Linda. Um, as I said, I've been working on uh, messages from Mongolia all week long. I've, I've preached uh, already uh, three or four times uh, messages that we've recorded and um, sent to them, getting ready to present tomorrow night and uh, Tuesday night. 
for the Mongolian church, and it'll be all over the country. Uh, anyone may vi uh, watch, obviously, on a, on a Facebook uh, feed. But in order to have you pray, I'm going to play a Mongolian um, uh, language song, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. You'll recognize the, the tune, and uh, just sing along if you can, can get the words. Amen. That's blessed be your name in Mongolia. I hope you enjoyed and are blessed by the pictures there. Um, as I said, my heart is there. Today in church, we're, we're having a special guest speaker. And so uh, I won't be sharing a message in the, uh, in, the, in the regular service. So I wanted to share with you just my reflections this week of what God has really poured into my heart 
Because as I preached last week on the fear of the Lord or fear of God from First um, Peter chapter 2 and verse 17, that verse you can memorize, respect everyone and love the family of believers, fear God, respect the king. I, I, uh, God just poured into my life just um, this truth and the power of this truth that we are commanded to fear God. You know, the last 18 months, uh, uh, our attention has been uh, upon our health and upon society and the economic health and the problems of the world. And we're just, um, it's not that we're just, but there's a lot of fear in the world. COVID virus and everything that, that occurred over 18 months has, has just raised our level of anxiety and fear. I was talking to a young man this week uh, that uh, uh, the level of stress in his life, he, he just doesn't know where it's coming from. And I said, well, it's everywhere. It's just everywhere. We, um, uh, it's, it's kind of pervading over everything that we do. But I, I find that the Bible does have a lot to say about fear, and I'm going to do a study of it, I promise you. But I just want to give you some reflections this morning. Most of us know what fear is. It's that, uh, it's that uh, um, unpleasant emotion that we have. It's that gut feeling that comes over us when uh, we are threatened, either with bodily harm or some potential danger, some loss that may, that may occur, maybe a loss of a job or loss of a home or, or uh, some pain that comes. We know what fear is. You know, when I, I grew up in the church, and uh, if I go back to the 70s, there, there were a lot of preachers going around casting out the spirit of fear. It was based on 1 Timothy, or I think it's 2 Timothy chapter uh, 1 and verse 7, where Paul says to Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Well, um, the preachers of, of the 70s identified that every fear that we have is a spirit. It's motivated by the spirits. And so they went from place to place, casting out a spirit of fear. If you mentioned anything, if you mentioned any anxiety or worry, they'd rebuke you because you had fear. It was just a, 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 a rampant misunderstanding of what God was saying. Yeah, there is a spirit of fear. I say it, I admit it, I know there is. But there's also a natural fear that is not, a, not spiritually motivated, not, not, doesn't come from the devil, is not possessive of us. It's just a natural worry and anxiety that happens. <laughs> you know, they combined that spirit, that, that spirit they combined that, that verse with Job chapter 3, verse 25. They said, as Job says, what I always feared has happened to me, and what I fear has come upon me. That's good King James. What I dreaded has come true. Boy, if you combine those, those two verses, there's a spirit of fear that comes upon us, and what we fear will come upon us. Then you're going to live in a terrible world. It's an awful place to be. That if every fear that I have is going to come upon me and that I have to fight that fear all the time, then that's all I'm going to be doing. Well, as I said, in the 70s, maybe even the early 80s, and maybe you can find some today <laughs> that went everywhere casting out the spirit of fear, telling us that fear was, was a, a sin or a lack of faith or worse, it was a sin. You couldn't talk about your worry or your anxiety or or any, any negative thing, because that which you fear will come upon you. Well, I guess if I believe that, I would go everywhere casting out a spirit of fear as well. But this is one of the teachings of the School of Christ that I greatly appreciate, and that is this. Brother Clinton Clendenin taught us that in life, Fear is a natural response to anything that will bring harm to our lives. And it's always going to be a part of our lives. It's always going to be there. 
because there's always going to be someone or something that is likely to cause harm. Fear is always going to be there. Well, the antidote that he gave for it is great faith. He said Moses was afraid to go to Egypt because um, he had killed a man and he had fled Egypt and now God was sending him back and he didn't want to go and he argued with God because, hey, I, I, I can't go back to Egypt. I, I can't go back to Egypt. I can't go back. Well, we know he did go and, 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 and it's very likely that every day he faced a fear. The devil would come to him and say, yeah, 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 you told him that the, the water is going to turn to blood, but you didn't have anything to do with that. That's just some algae. That's a natural occurrence. It happens every year about this time. You had nothing to do with those frogs. Those frogs, uh, uh, this is a 17-year curse of frogs. It all happens every 17 years on a cycle. It, you, you, just, you just got lucky. So every day he had to face that fear that his words weren't the words of God and God wasn't working on his behalf. And, and so every day he faces that fear and his faith has to be stronger than his fear. And he has to stand on the side of faith and stand up and do what God has called him to do. And I just love that teaching because I, I believe it. I believe that there is a natural fear in our lives that has to be overcome. And it's overcome by faith. It's overcome by our faith. In our life, we have to overcome fear. And we have to allow our faith to become bigger than our fear. We have to stand up on the side of faith. Now, I know that I can emphasize faith this morning and reading the Word of God and prayer and praying in the Spirit. And that's 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 really one great focus. I, I could tell you that if you want to build your faith, that's where you start, okay? You pray in the Holy Spirit, you, you get into the Word of God, you meditate upon that Word, and then you launch out in faith. That, that's a great place to start right there. But I, I, I want to, to, I was overwhelmed this week by Isaiah chapter 8 that I read to you last week. And in and, and, and verse number 11, um, the Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. Listen to those words. The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. God is speaking to our lives about our fears. He says this, don't call everything a, a conspiracy like they do. Don't live in dread of what frightens them. Now that's a command to us, okay? Don't be afraid of what everyone else is afraid of. Again, <laughs> how do I do that, Jesus? How do I do that? Well, I, I've got to build up my faith. I've got to pray. I've got to read my Bible. I've I got to be with people who are, are, are like-minded. I know that. But that's not the answer that God gives in this passage of Isaiah 8. Verse 13 says, Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. He is the one you should fear. He is the one who should make you tremble. He will keep you safe. But to Israel and Judah, he will be a stone that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he'll be a trap and a snare. As I said, there's no mention of faith in this passage. He doesn't say, let your faith overcome your fear. But there is a principle given. Fear me, and you won't have to fear the enemy. The nation was living in fear. I'm talking about terror, trembling fear. Their knees are knocking together. They are afraid of the enemy army. And in fact, um, <laughs> I think that that's the definition of fear right there. And God says, fear me and you won't have to tremble because of the army. 
This command is a strong warning. Don't think like everyone else. Don't call, don't live in dread of what frightens you or frightens them. If I want my faith to grow stronger, then I must focus my fear upon God. The contrast in these verses are very telling to me, and they're very powerful. Because it says the same fear you have of the enemy, focus that fear upon God. I know fear in the Bible has a fairly wide range of meaning. I know it can mean worry and anxiety over the unknown. I know it can mean reverence and awe of that which is worthy and honorable. But it can also mean trembling fear or terror. And in fact, if you keep this verse in context... If you keep this verse in context, then you will find that the word, the comparison is, is very powerful. He says, the fear you have against the enemy, you need to fear me at the same way. The fear of the enemy. If I want my faith to grow, then I have to allow God to become big. I have to allow him to become strong. I have to allow him to become powerful. I have to allow him to become able to do anything and everything above those things which I can think or imagine. I've got to let him out of the box. I've got to let him become God. He spoke this world into existence. They tell me it's 14 billion years old. They tell me that it's so wide that it takes uh, that 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 it, it is beyond anything comprehensible to comprehensible to to us. But God spoke this world into existence, uh, and you walk around as if He is not someone to be feared. I have dwelt in that this week. I've looked at the teachings of Jesus because he, he gives us this word, Matthew. He says, don't be afraid of those things that threaten you. For the time is coming when everything that is, that is covered will be revealed. And all that is secret will be made known. When I, what I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad when the daylight comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout from the housetops for all to hear. Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin? What, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground that you, without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are numbered, so don't be afraid of other people. You are more valuable to God than the whole flock of sparrows. What a contrast that God gives to us here. Jesus tells us, don't be afraid of men. Don't be afraid of circumstances. You just do what God has called you to do. He had sent them out to preach this gospel. They went out. They were threatened. They, they faced opposition. But he says, don't fear them. You just do what God has asked you to do. I guess I'm speaking to preachers a lot this week because that's who I'm trying to minister to in Mongolia. But I would say that to each one of us, not just the preacher, not just those who call to ministry. If God has called you, by all means, don't be afraid of man or what man will say or anyone will try to distract you. You fear God. That means you obey him. You go and you do what God has called you to do. At the same time, uh, I, I, I also know that this verse expresses the great care and the concern of God if we will put this in the right order. If I will fear him above everything else, he will make me safe. I will walk in his protection. I will walk in his provision. 
it says to us that the very hairs on your head are numbered. That is great concern that the Lord declares, but it begins when I express my fear of the Lord. And when I fear the Lord, I don't have to fear anyone else. Earlier I quoted from Job as Job said, you know, what I, what I have feared has come upon me. What I have dreaded has happened to me. So here was this rich man, had a great family. His families were wealthy. His, um, his life, um, so blessed. And in that blessing, he had a fear, a dread. What if I lose it all? What, what if, what if? Something bad happens. Well, it happened. And if you know the story of Job, his friends came to him and said, you've done something wrong or God wouldn't have punished you. You're being punished because of your sin. And Job defends himself. He said, I, I'm, I'm righteous, man. I haven't done anything wrong. And so finally he decides that he would take his case to God. And when he takes his case to God, God comes to him and reveals the awesomeness of his power. He asked Job things like, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? Where were you when I set the border of the sea? Where were you? Are you greater than the Leviathan? Are, do you, do you, uh, who are you, Job? In the last chapter of the book, Job answers the question of, who is asking this question of God. He says in, verse, in chapter 42 and verse 2, he says, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You ask, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? That was Job. It is I. And I was talking about things that I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen and I will speak. I have some questions for you and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. God never answers the question of why, Job. Why God, I guess, is the question. He never answered that question that Job would have asked him. God just simply revealed his power, his majesty, his glory. That is far beyond anything that we can imagine. And as he, as he reveals himself to Job, Job responds with fear and reverence and awe. He responds in repentance and sackcloth and ashes because he knows that I've seen God with my own eyes and he's far too wonderful and far too great for me to question. I call you today and ask the, or, or reveal the principle for us That if we fear God, we won't have to fear our enemy. I believe that this applies in every area of our lives. Many people live in fear of other people. Some of us live in fear of sickness or disease or death or financial struggle or, or other, as I said, others' opinions. We walk in doubt and anxiety and depression because we can't control our, other, our futures. We're fearing what others fear. And God says, don't do that. Don't fear what others fear. Instead, I call you today, as I did last week, to fear God, to respect him and honor him and reverence him and to acknowledge that he is powerful. Job demanded that question of why, God. And God says, I am the creator and sustainer of the universe, and who are you? Well, 
Job, when he saw God, had nothing else to fear. I believe he came into the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Today, I'm praying for you that God will reveal himself. Just as he did to Job, just as he does to, I believe, through Christ in the New Testament. He reveals the greatness of his love and his compassion. But he also reveals the greatness of his power, that he is the judge of all the earth, the creator of this universe. He is to be feared, to be honored, to be reverenced, but to tremble before him as well. Father, I pray that this nation will come again to a place where they fear you. We walk in fear today, fear of sickness and disease that we cannot cure, fear of other people and their opinions, and what matters to us is our things and the loss that potential loss that sits before us. But Lord, may we receive that strong warning this morning not to fear what everyone else fears, that we will come and sit in your presence and hear your voice, that we will learn to walk in obedience and in holiness and in righteousness because, oh God, you are worthy of our lives, that we will walk in fear of the Lord, and that fear of the Lord will open the door to wisdom and understanding and it will open the door to your blessing and your prosperity. It will open the door, oh God, to your gifts and your grace. It will open the door to your provision and your protection. You watch over the sparrow and truly you watch over us. God, oh God, may we May we tremble before you. May we fear our God so that we will have to fear nothing else. Let us walk in the courage, the boldness of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the boldness of the Holy Spirit. God, that we can stand against the enemy in whatever they say and whatever, O oh Lord, they may threaten. And may we stand with you and do your will, Lord, whatever it may be. God, I give you praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you again. I ask you to pray for a Mongolian um, um, preaching Facebook Live event over the next two days. It actually uh, will be uh, our Monday morning and Tuesday morning at about six. So if you pray today and if you're up uh, early in tomorrow, the next two days, pray for the Mongolian church to be blessed uh, from the messages that we have sent to them. Uh, we love you. Looking forward to uh, seeing you next time. Amen.